Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this vodcast is based on an excellent exhibit done last year by Ryan Stevens, who's one of our residents, on distal pancreatectomies. And today is Tuesday when I'm recording it, so I'm in between pancreatic cancer conferences. So it's really a good time, perhaps, to take a good look at distal pancreatectomies, because in about um, an hour, I'm going to go to the uh, case review. And I'll see plenty of distal pancreatectomies. And the challenge, of course, is um, twofold. One is patients who've had recent distal pancreatectomies, and then you're always looking for complications. And then patients who've had distal pancreatectomies in the past, where often you're looking for tumor spread or tumor occurrence. Um, distal pancreatectomy, just some teaching points, primary surgical treatment for lesions that arise in the body and tail of the pancreas. There's several variations in surgical technique, and especially these days, most distal pancreatectomies at Hopkins are done laparoscopically or with robotic surgery. They're typically not done with open procedures. CT is used preoperatively and postoperatively. And as I mentioned at the start, it's very important to understand what you're going to see in the post-op state to not confuse complications or routine post-op changes with tumor occurrence. So that becomes very important. So we'll look at some of the regional anatomy near the tail of the pancreas, review the indications and surgical approaches for distal pancreatectomy, and then look at some of the post-operative appearances. And so um, we use many of the cinematic rendering images. You can see a very nice example here of showing you the different parts of the patient's uh, pancreas, and you can see nicely the tail sitting against the splenic artery and splenic vein and near the hilum. The uh, regional anatomy basically is the derivative of the embryologic foregut, the pancreas, an elongated endocrine and exocrine organ. We talk about a length of up to 22 centimeters, though we tend not to think about length because often the pancreas can be somewhat redundant, and so the absolute length is never a criteria in um, defining disease. We talk about organ div division into head, body, and tail. We talk about a neck and an uncinate. But again, borders become somewhat arbitrary in many times. And it's in the region of the anterior perirenal space, except for the pancreatic tail, which is essentially intraperitoneal. We look at the head. You can see the relationships to the C-loop, SMA. We talk about the uh, uncinate process, the most inferior aspect of the pancreas. One of the challenges when we do deep learning is teaching the computer to recognize tumors that come off the uncinate process. And again, when we talk about body and tail, as the statement makes, there's no clear plane talking about body and tail. I often think about lesions near body and tail as tumors near the body-tail junction, but there is no real junction. So, you know, you could do certain measurements, but I think we know what the tail is distally, but where are the body and tail transition? We talk about that with mucinocystic neoplasms, where there's a transition is somewhat a bit more tedious. We talk also about anatomy. When you talk about the pancreas in general, things become critical on the arterial side, the celiac, hepatic, and splenic, the SMA, and all of the branches. We talk about the veins, portal vein, splenic vein. And when you talk about tail of pancreas, the main things you're thinking about are the splenic artery and vein. Lots of variations in the splenic artery, including numbers and branching, a little bit less variation in terms of the patient's uh, splenic vein. And you can see when you start looking at the arterial supply, uh, we talk about the head and neck branches off the pancreaticoduodenal artery arising from the GDA and dorsal pancreatic artery. Inferiorly, these anastomose with the branches off the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery and retropancreatic arcades. And the body is supplied by the dorsal and gradal pancreatic arteries. And the tail is supplied by the inferior and caudal pancreatic arteries, which are branches off the splenic artery. Venous drainage, there's less variation. Again, portal vein, SMV, splenic vein, very little variation in that. There's a few side branches we speak about. Uh, uh, the body and tail are drained by numerous collateral branches, the inferior and caudal pancreatic veins, all of which drain into the splenic vein. 
We also know that when this tumor is in the tail of the pancreas or even inflammation, it's not uncommon to have invasion or occlusion of the splenic vein, and then you do see significant collaterals. So that's something we do speak about. Now, when you look about and going back to uh, distal pancreatectomy, surgical uh, treatment of choice for a wide range of different tumors, benign and malignant. When you look at the ones I tend to be concerned about, I tend to be concerned about the malignancies both on the adenocarcinoma side as well as on the neuroendocrine side. A mucinous cystic neoplasms commonly located at body tail junction. Serous cyst adenomas more common in the pancreatic head but can occur in the pancreatic tail. So there's a range of different tumors that we can see. And if you look at some of the different indications for distal pancreatectomy, you can see anywhere from serous cystic tumors to mucinous tumors to adenocarcinoma to neuroendocrine tumors to chronic pancreatitis. In terms of the surgical approaches, open and laparoscopic approaches, as I mentioned at Hopkins, laparoscopic or robotic is really what we typically do. Open approach classically for malignancies, uh, at times when you're worrying about tumor spread, though, again, laparoscopically you can do as well, surely in terms of sampling nodes. There's a lot more work now being go going on for improving the laparoscopic approach for distal pancreatectomy, surely for small lesions, particularly neuroendocrine tumors, lesions you're uncertain about. Uh, anytime you want to be less invasive, a distal is going to be better. But even for adenocarcinoma, a lot of people are doing things laparoscopically. With a laparoscopic approach, we typically, or open approach, there's typically an on-block resection of the tail and spleen. People have in the past done uh, spleen-sparing distal pancreatectomies, but invariably patients got complications from abscesses to bleeds and to pseudoaneurysms and the like, that I think although it's a valiant thought and often it seems like it's something that should be easy to do. It's typically hard to do and it's uncommon to do it. There are two primary preserving techniques of the spleen. Uh, it may be performed by dividing the splenic vasculature distal to the pancreatic tail so the spleen is vascularized by the short gastric vessels or the entire splenic artery and vein can be conserved. And those of you who've seen cases where the spleen was left behind, not uncommon to see infarcts and abscesses and all sorts of complications like bleeds. And I think for the most part, when you're taking out the distal pancreas, you're taking out the spleen. This was an article we published a number of years ago in AJR, Chris Wolfgang, one of our fine surgeons was the lead author talking about the approach to distal pancreatectomy from the mobilization of the spleen and pancreas, isolation of the artery and vein, and then the, the wide dissection with the anastomosis. And I'll leave that to you surgeons in the audience to pay attention to that. We also are now seeing uh, distal pancreatectomies and splenectomies as part of Appleby procedure. That's a procedure we commonly do in patients who have unresectable pancreatic cancer. They respond to chemotherapy but the celiac is encased, and so you need to resect the celiac and the pancreas distally and the spleen. It's an impressive surgery. We have having good results. 90% of the patients at Hopkins who've gone for Applebee's have had negative tumor margin. So patients have had chemo and radiation therapy. If you're doing an Applebee, you better be near certain that the patient does not have any residual tumor. It's just too big an operation. Now, um, with uh, Appleby procedures, we will follow the patients up with dual phase imaging, looking for complications. One of the challenges, of course, in looking at um, post Appleby procedure, not just distal pancreatectomy, there's lots of thickening by the celiac, and you don't want to be routinely overcalling that tumor occurrence. In terms of post operative appearances, there are a number of things you can see. You can see fluids, fat stranding, and edema by lesser sac and splenic bed and by tail of pancreas. This will typically resolve over time. Smaller fluid collections adjacent to the pancreatic stump, stump rather, are seen in nearly half the cases. And uh, 
that's not uncommon. And it's typically not a problem. When the collections are large, you're worrying about a leak. When there's small collections, it's typically a normal post-operative finding. And we are seeing more commonly, particularly in patients done laparoscopically, omental or fat necrosis. You often see a mass that has fat within it. It can be very large. And if you've never seen it before, you really think about tumor recurrence. So it's something to be aware of. And I'll show you some examples because those those uh, omental infarcts are large. They remain the same over time. And if you call it the wrong diagnosis, you're going to be chasing the patient down the wrong therapy mode. So some simple things. Here's a very classic post-operative study. Fluid by the surgical margins near the surgical clip, tracking near the stomach, and the splenic bed. Again, another example, looking at the coronal view. So it's very common to see small fluid collections in that region. Here's a nice example of classic omental uh, inf oh, infarction or fat necrosis. You see the model density, the soft tissue. You see the striations or septations, and you see the fat. Mass effect, these patients do well. These omental infarcts typically remain constant. Sometimes they resolve, but often they remain constant. Here's another one by the tail of the pancreas. And again, you can see that they occur typically by the surgical bed, can push against the stomach, can be large. And you can see why perhaps to the unsophisticated or the people not in the know, you can see why you would consider them to be tumor occurrences. Now, when you look at some of the more problematic postoperative complications, distal pancreatectomy, morbidity, mortality, 31 to 47 percent, and 0.25 to 0.3 to 3 percent, respectively. There's no significant differences for open versus laparoscopic, and splenectomy versus spleen preservation. Most common complications are pancreatic fistulae, intraabdominal abscess, postoperative hemorrhage, and small bowel obstruction. Uh, risk factors for complications, high ASA scores, obesity, multivisceral resection, and a malignant lesion. When you talk about complications, anytime you do pancreatic resection, you're always worried about pancreatic fistula, though truthfully they're not that common. Often associated with other complications from abscess to hemorrhage to sepsis. Debate and conflicting data exist in the literature regarding the method of stump closure and pancreatic fistula rates. And despite morbidity associated with fistulas, the majority resolve spontaneously with conservative management. So it's one of those leave alone lesion. However, on the flip side, it's the most common complication following distal pancreatectomy and carries high morbidity. A fistula in general refers to leakage of amylase fluid, usually adjacent to the pancreatic remnant. And the International Study Group of Pancreatic Fistula uh, spoke about pancreatic fistula as being any drain output with an amylase more than three times the upper limit of normal, so greater than 300, at post-op three day or later. Or um, when you have fistulae or asymptomatic with only elevated drain amylase levels, grade B or symptomatic, remember grade A or asymptomatic. Uh, grade B are suspicious fluid collections not requiring treatment, and grade C are severe collections requiring radiologic or surgical intervention. So there has been some work on trying to categorize this, but I think it is a little bit easier to characterize on a sheet of paper than it is in person. Another complication is obviously an abscess, can be associated with a fistula. You can see postoperative hemorrhage, but if you think about it, the complications you see with distal pancreatectomy a little different than patients who you see with Whipple's procedure. Again, you always worry about fistula, abscess, bleed, obstruction, infarction. Here's a post-operative fistula, which you can see very nicely. You can see lots of inflammation, the mesenteric fat and stranding present. It extends to the splenectomy bed and truthfully almost looks like a developing omental infarct. Here's a fistula with an abscess, and of course you can recognize it easier because you're seeing multiple air bubbles present, and in the post-op patient, you may see a little bit of air, but in this situation, you know and you should expect that there's an intra-abdominal abscess present and a pancreatic fistula or leak 
is present as well. Nice example. Or in this case, you see a lesser sac collection has a model density. It almost has some components suggesting mesenteric inflammation or a mental infarct, but the size and location makes you think about an abscess. And here's a complication that's uncommon where the patient has a gastro, gastro, gastric fistula into the splenectomy bed and into the distal pancreatectomy bed. That's a very unusual finding, but indeed it can occur. Adjacent organs can always be involved in patients with complex surgery. Postoperative hematomas occur, and again, whether it's Whipple's procedure or it's a uh, Appleby or distal pancreatectomy, hematomas are not uncommon. You see high density, you know it's blood. It's probably less common for us to see active contrast extravasation, but you will look carefully. One of the reasons we do dual phase imaging in patients with droponematocrine and the procedure like a Whipple's or a distal pancreatectomy is look for the source of bleeding. And here's just a good example of a source of bleed from a GDA branch. So you need to look very carefully Again, when we do bleeding, we're doing dual phase imaging, arterial and venous, good distension, and you're looking for the site of bleed, which can be subtle, but again, here is very obvious on this example. Or in this case, we see acute perioperative hemorrhage from the splenic artery stump. You see the active contrast extravasation best seen on the venous phase imaging. Just a beautiful example, the high density collection tells you this bleeding, and the active extravasation shows you where it's from, and this patient will get embolization. Or in this case, where the patient has a large splenic artery pseudoaneurysm, where the patient will either get embolized or they will have that removed surgically. Typically, you'd like to be doing this um, with embolization. So there's several take-home points. Distal pancreatectomy is not an uncommon procedure. It's the main surgical treatment for a wide range of benign and malignant pathology in the pancreatic body and tail. Several surgical approaches exist for distal pancreatectomy and pancreatic remnant closure with no clear consensus on, on the superiority of any method. Small fluid collections, fat stranding, or mental or fat necrosis are all common postoperative findings which typically resolve on their own. So again, one of the things where CT is helpful is managing the patients without aggressive intervention. Among the common complications, pancreatic fistulae, intradominal abscess, and hemorrhage account for the highest morbidity. And as radiologists, we need to have a detailed understanding of the normal postoperative findings so we don't pursue things the wrong way, as well as the knowledge of the common uh, to life-threatening complications in order to arrive at the correct diagnosis. And I think if you read this article and you look at a bunch more cases, many of which you can find on CT Us, CT is Us, you will be terrific at looking at patients with distal pancreatectomies. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Catch you later. Bye.